and welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And if you haven't done so yet, check out my weekly email where I'm sharing actionable website and marketing tips, useful podcasts, free resources, goodies, and much, much more so you can kick off your week with a bang. Give it a shot over at businessgrowth.email. So today, joining me, I've got Jeff Gapinski. Jeff's a partner over at Humor. They help companies big and small discover what makes them unique and channel it into a memorable, memorable experience that outsells and outshines the competition online. Jeff, welcome to the show, mate. How are you doing? Hey, man. Nice to speak with you again. Thank you for having me on. No worries, man. Looking, looking forward to our chat. And we've been, we've been connected on LinkedIn. We've had some conversations over the last few months. We're enjoying each other's web content. So I'm glad to, glad to get you on the show and looking forward to a, a bit of a back and forth today. And we're going to be discussing all things around how a website can scale a business that's established, that's already growing. And perhaps for, for many people that have got doubts about their website, really, perhaps people that are considering like, or thinking things like, I'm not sure our website works hard enough for our business. I think our sales reps are way better. Do we even need a good website? So we can hopefully put all those doubts, put all those objections and concerns to rest, at least in our minds, if not anyone else's. Anyway, with that said, what is the difference, Jeff? Let's tear off with this. What's the difference between perhaps a website for a brand new, fresh startup company and then more of an established and a medium-sized company? Sir, sure. yeah, that, that is a great question to kind of kick it off. So from my perspective, startups, whether you're bootstrapped or even a, a financed organization, really should be focusing on just getting something out there and, and focus mm -hmm. less on getting everything absolutely right from the jump. Sure. You don't need to have a huge budget in order to do that. You don't need to frankly, hire an agency to do that. You could probably get it done effectively with uh, a freelancer or just some, some minor help there. But, you know, you're trying to establish a business and, and prove a proof of concept. And yeah. you want to be nimble in that process. Uh, as you start to become a more established business, that's when you really want to start to invest more, not only in the look, feel, and technology of the site, but the, the language, the messaging, and the positioning of the site, because that's what is going to allow uh, prospective customers to come to your site and you know, understand what you're all about and really resonate with, with what you're presenting and then ultimately turn into uh, you know, an opportunity and then hopefully a closed deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to jump into, in your opinion, Jeff, some of the most important elements that make up a, a website because I know you touched on them there in terms of kind of brand copy positioning and all that good stuff that we can jump into shortly but yeah I'm kind of with the same mindset because when I speak to people Jeff in the startup world that you kind of get two ends of the spectrum some people that like you touched on are really really concerned so they'll spend almost endless amounts of time trying to get their website right and then I think you've got other people at the other end of the spectrum that basically don't give a shit about the website it's just like oh we've, we've got a couple pages we kind of built it on wix or squarespace or whatever one of the tools and i'm kind of in the middle if you if you are starting a business quite often when when these companies are bootstrapped and have a limited budget and want to go to market quite often like you say i'll i'll, I'll say look we're the investment to actually hire an agency is going to be quite significant to get something out there just to kind of almost get get your company a, a decent brand get some information about what you do and the services you present there's no harm in doing a builder, whether that's a WordPress builder or a Squarespace, just so you've got something out on the market. And then as you grow, then consider kind of ramping up the investment when you need to the website to perhaps perform a bit better, generate some leads, etc. What are your thoughts yeah. there? I, th I think the best the best combination is to if you're a startup, you put something out there, right? And with, with yeah. an initial shot. Um, but then you you know just put it out there and let it sit and, and do nothing with it. Um, you know, make sure you have analytics installed, make sure you have behavior tracking software installed. A lot of this stuff can be added very affordably, especially if you don't have a ton of traffic coming into the site yeah. and then use that to, to get interest uh, insights from the site and then make incremental improvement. So using something super flexible, like a Squarespace is actually a really good idea because then the insights you get 
your turnaround time to actually implementing them in that initial site is a lot quicker and you'll, you'll see the, the results of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a, it's a trial and error because also what you'll see with a lot of startups is pivots, right? Like the offer you come out with day one might not be yeah, for sure. a year later. So you want to give yourself the flexibility and room to, to adjust to that. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Makes sense. So in terms of a, in terms of the website and this is going to vary. So perhaps I can give you a scenario. So maybe let's say we're a B2B tech company. Are there specific goals that you should have for your website? And appreciate this might vary from niche to niche, but are there any kind of key goals you think that should be in place for a website for a growing company? For, for like a more established company that's trying to scale up. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, you need to, especially in the, the tech industry, uh, you need to be able to concisely communicate what it is you do and what problem you're solving immediately on the site. So the second I land there, uh, the, you know, the hero banner on the homepage needs to make that evidently clear to me. It's really difficult for tech companies at times to accomplish that because you know, there might be a lot of nuance. There might be a lot of jargon that people don't understand, but it really should be your mission to break that down so that your target audience understands things immediately. Um, the homepage in general should do a really good job of building trust. So, you know, establishing through third party proof, case studies, uh, testimonials, you know, a bunch of different ways how other people have consumed your, your product or service and how it's benefited them, right? That needs to be super sure. Important. And then I'm sure a lot of people watching this, a lot of business owners can, can empathize that uh, hiring is really difficult right now for a lot of companies. So, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about is focused on buyers, but we also need to be focused on recruiting, especially in the tech field, super duper competitive. You need to be able to give people a glimpse as to what the company culture is like, what to uh, expect behind the scenes, what benefits are offered, easy access to job postings, you know, all of that needs to be incorporated in a smart way on the site. Yeah. 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 So it sounds like quite a range in terms of clearly communicating kind of what you do, the problem you, you solve, how you help building that trust element with things like social proof, whether that's reviews, testimonials and all that good stuff. And then also looking at the, the job posting element side of things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, I mean, obviously, I'm a very biased because I'm from the same background as yourself. But do you think your website should be your main tool for generating business, kind of no matter what industry you're from? Or do you think it's it varies quite a bit? Because I'm sure you, you have similar conversations where some people just think their website is, is there as more of a shop window or an online brochure, if you will. And then you've got people at the other end of the scale that kind of use it as a life and soul to, to really fuel their sales team. Sure. Yeah. So I actually spoke about this not too long ago on a, on a different podcast, but sure. uh, another way that question was, was framed was, you know, our website still going to be relevant a couple of years from now. And mm. I think for any sort of high ticket service, uh, enterprise B2B, enterprise SaaS, absolutely the website is going to be a very critical factor in buying decisions and something that you should be leveraging and investing a lot of money in to acquire new business. When we're talking about smaller businesses and I'm talking, you know, mom, pop, main street type businesses, I actually don't believe that a website is going to be as big of a factor because I think there's a lot of other things going on right now that are creating enablement for sales. So yep. If you're a local plumber, let's say, you might not even need a website. You can probably get away with just the Google My Business tools. To, to I was going to say that, especially if you're a tradesman. Cool. Right. Especially in the UK, the demand for those kind of things is just through the roof. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're selling something that's you know high ticket, complicated, and mm. and that span through a bunch of different industries you're going to need a website because it, it's another layer of established trust. And again, just another way to prove that you're a market leader for some of these other uh, 
uh, I guess, commoditized services and things like that, it's probably going to become less and less of a factor. I even see it with some um, like smaller e-commerce stores are actually able to facilitate a lot of their sales through social channels or Amazon or, or other factors and, and have difficulties at times being able to break into you know, their own store kind of leading, leading the sales for the organization. So I think, I think there's some nuance in there, but I think for a lot of the people watching this, your website is probably, you know, definitely going to be a, a main factor and something you need to invest in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It reminds me of something I was chatting to someone about a little while back where I think I saw some, a post on LinkedIn or somewhere else and sp- basically someone was saying like the website is just a waste of time it should just be something that's got a bit of information on your company and kind of what you do and i kind of this was someone who was uh basically selling outbound calling services which i'm not against in fact we have kind of sales sales leaders on the show quite a lot because i like to get the point of view from sales people as well as marketers anyway um my counter to that was well think of it this way if you're um you might think the website's not doing something much for you, but because you're doing cold outreach, but what's the chances when you're reaching out to someone cold, whether that's social, whether that's LinkedIn, email, cold calling, they're probably going to look up your website after a sales rep's been in touch before they have the appointment. So they're probably going to kind of make a decision on if you've got a shocking website that takes ages to load, it's really slow, it just looks poor, doesn't open well on mobile, it's hard to understand what you do, how you can help them, maybe doesn't have examples of social proof or case studies and just is cumbersome and difficult to navigate as opposed to having a super slick website that loads fast, clearly shows what you do, builds trust. Surely they're going to weight some bias towards the company that does it well. And likewise, if you get a referral, let's say you're looking to invest quite heavily in some kind of SaaS software and someone you get a couple of recommendations, maybe you find one online and maybe you get referred by a friend. If the site you check out just looks absolutely shocking, it's hard to navigate, does all those things that I just mentioned. In my opinion, anyway, I'm going to bias towards the one that gives me a better experience. And that potential business won't even know that I've dropped off because I've never inquired with them just because their website didn't convert me in or didn't build that trust with me, if you saw what I mean. Don't know what your thoughts are there, Jeff. Yeah, I, I've heard that too. Uh, and, and obviously I, I have some, some strong opinions about it, but I think that as human beings, as, as much as we want to think that we are logical buyers we're not logical creatures, we'll, we'll use logic to, to back up a gut decision, but yeah. think about how many things people buy that are purely based on design or aesthetic, right? Like car shopping, you can go get a car for 20 grand. Um, or you can go get a car for $250,000. There's going to yeah. be certain things about that $250,000 vehicle that's really attractive. A lot of it has to come to the design, the aesthetic, the finish of the vehicle. It demands a higher price because it is perceived to be more premium. Websites for businesses often give the same appeal. You know, When we first started out, we were a very small company. We didn't have a lot of established... Um, you know, uh, rep or history. I was a 22 year old kid and I was really good at a skill. That skill was visual design. So what did we do? We went out there and we built a really slick looking website. We put it out there in the world and we were immediately perceived to be a bigger organization than we were. That is something that any company and any industry can do. And the bar of doing that is significantly lower in certain places than others. But I guess to get back to the original point, I absolutely think that websites are a decision-making factor. A lot of buyers don't want to be sold to. They want to be presented information and they want to be able to make a decision based on the information that they're receiving. So you can do your cold calling and kind of spark the awareness, but they're going to go out and do their own due diligence and, and look you up. And if what they're looking at sucks, you're going to get disqualified from that conversation. I've also got a counter to my own and basically our both statements there. Like the one time that I'd probably go against that is if the recommendation was so strong and if the, let's say in my case, for example, there was something similar, like I'd been following someone on LinkedIn for good six, seven, eight months and their content resonated with me. Like for example, they gave actionable tips on what they do 
how they help. They gave useful points each day. So literally value in the feed. So they didn't have the best website. Because I bought into that person so much, I actually just direct messaged them on LinkedIn. And I think that's probably the only exception that I take because I was such a warm lead by that stage because I've been consuming their content for so long. I just reached out to them directly. Whereas if I was perhaps a bit colder and maybe I searched for the service they do on Google, not knowing their company directly. So I searched like best X company or product service provider in this industry, whatever, and then found their website. I, I just wouldn't have converted. So that's, that's kind of my counter to that that's, in the only situation. That's the, that's the difference maker though, right? So they were able mm. to um, provide you with that, that educated experience and build trust through a channel that wasn't their website. It took exactly. you eight months consuming their content to be like, you know what, I'm going with these guys. However, to the cold buyer who's not getting that experience, not following them on LinkedIn, um, they're not getting that. I would bet money that they would sell and convert more if they took some of that experience that they have going through their social channels and then brought it to their website in, in a meaningful way. Um, so it's not the only way you can get business, obviously, but sure. it should kind of be the hub of everything because it's a it's an area that you control, right? Like you own your website. You don't own LinkedIn. You don't own Facebook. You don't own Instagram. They can yep. change what their policies are like that. It's happened before. There's been people who've built businesses on the backs of platforms that died or became a whole lot yes. less. I nearly so, cried when I got banned on LinkedIn, but luckily it was when I was getting married. So I was, yeah. I was off my phone for three days, and then three days later I got back on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's people that were using the the LinkedIn Pulse publishing feature to basically like run their blog, right? And then that gets degraded, and now what do you do with all that content? Mm. Um, so it's always, I think it's always good to have it as your hub and have it as a focal point. And, and even more so, the larger you are and the more high priced the product is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, something I chat about, I think we're on a similar wavelength that one of the great things about your website is it's an owned asset, provided you don't build it on a rented tool like Squarespace or, or Wix or something like that. Not that I'm saying there's anything against them. You just don't control the code. So they, they do own it. But like you say, LinkedIn or video channels or social channels could flick the switch and the algorithm goes down or the reach goes down. So your website is something you're, you're always going to own the content and assets around. So it's something to, to bear in mind around your marketing strategy, not necessarily to say everything on your website, but to bear in mind a multi-channel approach, having various streams to, to drive inbound customers always, always makes sense for sure. Mm -hmm. So with that said, we touched on a bit earlier, but in your opinion, Jeff, let's, let's nail down some of the key things that you should focus on your website to actually make us make it a success whether your goals are building brand whether your goals are recruiting or whether it are, is driving inbound business or generating leads what are some of the, the key pages or key design elements or copy elements that we should kind of consider sure yeah um so i would say high level um messaging should should be the first thing you focus on you know are you putting out a message that makes it clear what it is you do who you do it for and messaging that resonates with your audience so you should be talking to things that are personal challenges to to the companies that that you're going after um as well as things that they can just get excited about right so first and foremost that's the most important um number two on my list i would say visual design and i know that's um maybe not number two on everybody's list, but going back to my previous point, especially working with companies that sell higher ticket products, visual design is, is a differentiator. You need to have not only a website that communicates well, but also looks really great in order to sell a premium product. The biggest bang for your buck areas that you can bring this through is, you know, the first impression on the site, right? I land on your homepage. There's going to be that hero header at the top of the screen. What does that look like? What does that say to me? Do I immediately get a feeling from that section of the page? Uh, another thing that you can do is incorporate um, social proof via testimonials, but do it in a way that's meaningful. So don't just throw them at the bottom of a page and hope that somebody gets them eventually. Interweave that messaging within each section that you talk about yourself. So if you're talking about 
you know, we offer the best customer service as an organization. That's great. A lot of people say that, but use a testimonial of a raving client or raving fan that yep. is up that claim. It makes it a lot stronger. Uh, another thing when you do it that way is most people don't get to the bottom of web pages, yet everybody always seems to throw their testimonials at the bottom of a web page, right? So if only 25% of your visitors are getting there, that means only 25% of the people are getting the value from your actual customers. So if you start incorporating it earlier in the experience, you get more eyes on those testimonials and they become a lot more effective for you. I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, definitely love the one in, in terms of kind of people scrolling through. Because I suppose if I look at it from my own perspective or a lot of kind of potential buyers that I chat to, most people when they come to your website, and I could be wrong in some cases, but essentially they want to know kind of what you do and how you can help them check that you can actually do what you say you do. So that's where the social proof weaving in, backing up your claims comes in, perhaps your case studies, your results, how you've actually done what you're, what you're speeding about for the whole of your site. Probably going to check your pricing at some stage. You want to know you're actually within your budget. And then on the, on the basis that you've ticked all those boxes, you've built enough trust and yet they're confident in what you can do. They'll probably reach out to you on a channel that they want to chat to you, whether that's kind of giving you a call or filling out a form or booking a time on a calendar on the basis that you have done all those things correct. Is that a full list? Not necessarily. I mean, every buyer's a bit different, right? Sure. And everyone's got different boxes they want to tick. But no, I like I like those points for sure. Yeah, the, the pricing point is really important. There's not enough transparency about that. People get really kind of, uh, I don't know, like clammed up about pricing. We make it very evident on our site what we charge for the different things that we do. We don't necessarily have a pricing tab, but it's interwoven into a lot of our content. People are qualifying on price, and especially now more than ever, where you know there's some maybe some instability in economies here in the U.S. as well as abroad. Yep, price matters. Pe people are going to to make decisions based off of that. If you're not close, it's not worth having the conversation on either end because you're just wasting each other's time. So making that super evident that that's real important too. Mm, mm. yeah certainly agree certainly agree i mean it's something I, I chat about on the show all the time um what probably frustrates me the most is having a pricing page and then requiring an email or some kind of data to actually see that pricing it's like oh dear you're just putting more friction in the process yeah, well, what's the point? it might count as a marketing qualified lead but at the end of the day it's probably going to waste your salesperson's time waste your prospects time when you could have just have a page that was, like you say, transparent. And also, the other thing I like about having a pricing page is that in some instances, it can actually send you or save you rather sending like quote documents and quote PDFs. Because if people straight away asking for price, you can literally just link them the page and say, have a look here. On that pricing page, you can back up claims like you were saying, Jeff, maybe you've got some customer videos, some interviews, maybe you've got some reviews and all that good stuff. So that maybe you've got some FAQs on the page as well. So they can kind of get all the info they needed to self-qualify and then decide if, if it makes sense to have a further chat. So it's, I don't think there's any negatives to it really from what I can see. Yeah. And to, I just want to kind of dig into the, the marketing qualified lead thing a little bit. So we didn't, we've been talking kind of about what the output of sites are, right. And what's important yeah. from that perspective. But if you are, small to mid-sized business and you are going through a website redesign, make it really clear up front what the goals are and make sure that from you know the C-suite down, everybody's aligned in terms of what those goals are. I see a lot of companies that are focused on lead volume. Yep. Lead volume is actually a really ter terrible metric to go off of because you can get a lot of leads and there's a lot of ways to generate a lot of leads, but if they're not actually qualified buyers and translating into revenue for the business, then you're just wasting a lot of time and money. So making sure that there's a focus on, you know, this is the type of buyer we want to track. This is what we determine as a sales qualified lead and that the marketing team, the sales team and the C-suite are all aligned on that. Super important because otherwise, Things are going to break down. Yeah. 
E-Suite's not going to see the results that they want in terms of revenue. They're going to be upset. The sales team is going to be chasing a bunch of leads that, uh, you know, aren't actually accurate. Or the marketing team is going to feel like they're not generating enough leads. So then they're doing other things to kind of lower that barrier. So everybody needs to be on the same page in terms of what they're moving towards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense, right? It's like when you do most projects, surely at the start you'd think, what are the end results? that we actually want to get out of this is it we want really qualified buyers that when they pick up the phone or book time on our sales team's calendar they're kind of 60 70 percent of the way through the journey um but it doesn't happen that often on websites quite often you'll just see kind of sites that are chucked together quickly and then they'll come to companies whether it's ours or someone else's and then you realize that these things weren't put in place at the start um or perhaps other things around their go-to-market strategy were perhaps not forgotten about so like you say thinking about what you actually want the site to do for you as a business as a whole and not just from your own opinion but from the c-suite from the marketing team etc is is really sound advice um and something another th on that note what are your thoughts on this jeff because i know you talked about marketing qualified leads just now because i know quite a lot of companies might gear their site up just as just purely to get, let's say, demo requests if you're B2B SaaS. So the main focus is for someone to consume the content of the site, maybe self-qualify and then book a demo when they're ready to speak to sales. But perhaps teams aren't getting enough qualified leads coming in. So you start panicking, chuck a bunch of gated eBooks on the site, chuck a bunch of kind of webinar signups, email marketing signups in the hope that it's going to drive leads. So the site starts getting kind of more and more gated as time goes on because there's pressure from higher up to to generate kind of more inquiries um what do you advise for teams that are perhaps in that situation yeah so that that is a, a good question so i i will preface and say that we currently have gated content on our site however we're most likely going to be moving away from it and it's not because i can't attribute revenue to that gated content i can contribute a lot of revenue to the gated content that we have my thought process on ungating it is the people who engaged with that gated content found the value in it, reached out to us, eventually became a client. It wasn't because we got their email up front with the gated content, right? Like we, we still would have been in that conversation regardless of whether or not that conversation, or the content was gated. The difference is I think more people would engage with the content had it not been gated in the first place. So in, in 2022, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of keep tabs on individuals that don't require them giving you their email address. There's tools out there like Clearbit, for instance, that gives you a lot of, uh, reduces the anonymity on, on website traffic and people who engage with your, your site. So you can still do those account-based marketing efforts without needing their email. The advantage of not having it gated is just that it's going to go to a wider audience and you're going to get more people broadly engaging with it. So I think there's other things we can do as marketers now to kind of persistently stay in front of our, our visitors that isn't just taking an email and sending them um, you know, a, a drip campaign or, or whatever on, on the back half. I think you still you want to build an email list, but just leave that to, hey, sign up for our newsletter and less of sign up for this thing and I'm going to throw you into our email list and send you a bunch of stuff that you may not really want to receive in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to go down the MQL versus SQL route today because we've done that plenty of times on the show. But yeah, I think I think it's about understanding really and probably getting from the, your customers their, themselves, actually, can they say this piece of content is valuable? Would they normally pay for it? If so, if they agree, I think, yes, stick it behind an email. We'll absolutely fine. That's my opinion anyway. I'm happy for people to say I'm wrong. But if if not, then it probably should just be on your site free to consume. Mm -hmm. um, is, is not a bad rule in my thoughts anyway. So we've talked to quite a lot about kind of best practices for the website in terms of what it can do, how it can help your business, some ideas that might help around kind of building trust, lead gen. What are your thoughts on go-to-market strategy, Jeff? What are some of the channels that you advise kind of mid-size or growing, scaling businesses that are some of the best that you've seen when it comes to actually attracting the right types of clients and traffic to your site, 
to actually produce those juicy leads and keep our sales team fueled and happy. Sure. So I think podcasts like the one we're on right now are actually a, a great tool of um, generating content for, for businesses because you know, one, one podcast can become a series of social posts. It can be transcribed into written content that can be used in a blog. Um, you know, there's a lot of value to that. It also gives you the opportunity to invite potential uh, prospects that, that you want to do business with or profiles that you want to do business with and, and get them to engage. So I think that's a really um, effective thing. I know podcasts have grown in popularity and there's a lot of them out there, but I do think that they have done well. They can be highly successful. Um, I'm a big proponent in thought leadership content. So, you know, even if you're not necessarily doing it in the live, like we are now putting together a series of posts that speak directly to the challenges that your customer base is experiencing and educating them on how to overcome those and placing yourself in thought leadership category there, and then distributing that across other channels. So that can be something that gets broken down into LinkedIn posts. That can be something that, you know, you take a few golden nuggets from that and turn it into email marketing. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities there. Sure. You know, aside from that, I think there's there's obviously you know short term advertising strategies that companies can put into place. Uh, I think that those channels will vary based on what you do. But if you're you're a B two B, using LinkedIn as a you know an advertising channel makes a whole lot of sense. We've seen a lot of customers actually have success with Twitter. Um, and using that as a as a channel uh, for yeah. advertising, um, I feel like these days, Facebook and, and Instagram specifically have been degraded a little bit, but can still be um, really valuable for for certain organizations. So that that stuff really depends. But I do think any any B two B who's looking to grow should be, you know, focusing on creating content that's going to be a value to their, their customers. I think first and foremost, that's got to be what they focus on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going back to the podcast point, I mean, I wish I started this podcast more than two years ago because it's helped us immensely in terms of kind of building awareness for web choice for the podcast itself as well, for making great relationships with contact contacts that perhaps we want to work with, or perhaps we want to kind of do joint partnerships, ventures with, etc. cetera. Um, building up authority. So positioning me from someone who knows next to nothing to someone who knows a little bit more about websites and SEO and marketing. So it's, it's all a win-win and it's like, say so such a low barrier to entry. So it's just a case, get off your ass and stop thinking about it and start doing it. Um, so yeah, strongly advise anyone who's on, on the fence about that to, to get stuck in because it is good fun and you get to meet some great people. But yeah, in terms of the other channels, like you say, I understand that it's going to be quite weighted towards the industry that you're in and what ad channels or what advertising channels or social channels actually make sense where your your target buyers are actually active on where they're hanging out and mm -hmm. where they're going to be able to consume your content what are your thoughts jeff on the seo front obviously something i bang on about all the time but do you think that from 2022 from where we are now and onwards that websites should be built because we've had a lot of guests that are saying seo is kind of dying and it's not as relevant anymore where do you stand do you think websites should be built from scratch with SEO in mind or what, what, where do you stand on it? Yeah. So, so going back, I think to the first question where we were talking about startups, right. Um, mm. It's, I think it's a bit of a debate for startups in terms of whether or not they should be investing in hev heavily in SEO. I think inherently any site should be built in a way that's conducive to SEO best practices. Right. So, sure. um, how you structure the sitemap, how you structure the pages themselves, making sure you're following best practices there, never gonna hurt. Um, yeah. For startups, again, because we're, we're talking about businesses that are trying to figure out exactly what's gonna be their sticky offer, investing a lot in a long-term strategy at that point, I don't think makes the most sense. Sure. Um, but for established businesses, absolutely. And it goes hand in hand with kind of what I was saying earlier regarding leadership and uh, thought leadership content. So mm. the thought leadership content you produce obviously should be very valuable to your target audience. And it should also be SEO optimized so that it increases the awareness um, for your brand. 
right? Like if you're not doing that, then it's a big missed opportunity. It's again, it was a strategy that we deployed very early on uh, and it remains a focus of ours. Uh, it's a big contributor to the amount of leads we receive on a monthly basis. I will say search engine optimization leads from my perspective, not just for us, but also for our customers tend to be the most shotgun approach type leads. So like sometimes you'll get a really qualified uh, MQL. Sometimes you'll get somebody who's less qualified, whereas other channels, you might be able to laser target your, your audience a little bit more, but by far the highest volume, lowest cost, highest ROI, uh, channel for people to invest in. So I don't think it's going away. Um, I think that there's other p places that people get information, but search is still going to remain a dominant force for years to come. Yeah. I mean, we're coming up to time for the show, but I think it's, it's one of those things. The good thing about SEO, in my opinion, anyway, is the fact that you can capture people at different ends of the funnel. Mm -hmm. So usually you can get quite quick wins. If you're looking at people that are researching your offering not necessarily exactly what you do but the old how-to questions or best way to do this questions mm -hmm. you can tackle middle of the funnel where people are comparing maybe your product to a competitor you can literally address that of content or people right at the bottom of the funnel where they're literally searching for a company in your sector best company for x or software accountancy or accountancy software for small businesses whatever it might be that specific search term where so that is the good thing it's not quick but like you say it is over time a great way to build up the only, the only thing to bear in mind is that it's a capturing demand channel in most cases um so as our friends chris walker over at refine labs like to talk about only roughly five percent of the market are actually in buying mode and that you're going to be able to capture and 95 percent are uh, there to be educated with with demand generation but that said depending on the size of your total addressable market that five percent or so could be huge mm -hmm. or it could be very small mm -hmm. so um something to consider for sure. All right, Jeff. Well, um, yeah, been a pleasure chatting all things how to scale your business with website. Any any final points before we wrap up the show today, sir? Just don't don't neglect your website, guys. Like focus. It can be a really really valuable tool. Uh, it could be something that is a game changer. We have a lot of companies that we've worked with that, you know, their website did not amount to a driving force with with their uh, business, but then. You know, you invest some time, you get the right people to think about the challenges that you're facing. It really, truly can become that 24 hour salesperson, Sam, that I know you speak about a lot as well. Um, so, yeah, don't neglect your sites. Well said, well said. Nice one, Jeff. Well, please do tell us more about how everyone tuning in can learn more about yourself, your company and the best way to connect with you and get in touch. Sir, you can follow me on LinkedIn. It's just Jeff, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Gapinski, G-A-P-I-N-S-K-I. -I. I post every day. Uh, and you can find humor at H-U-E-M-O-R dot R-O-C-K-S. All right. Nice one, man. I'll put all of those links over in the show notes over at businessgrowth.marketing. And with that, thanks once again for coming on, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. No worries, dude. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, a quick rating or review on your podcast channel of choice is much appreciated. And with that, we should catch you on the next episode for more No BS actionable marketing tips to grow your business and grow your revenue. Cheers for tuning in.